Now for today's program. Harry Castleman is a lawyer specializing in business, real estate, probate, and intellectual property law in Boston. He has co-authored nine popular culture books with Wally Pedrajic, three of which chronicled the history of the Beatles, with the others being on the history of television. Harry and Wally also co-authored several published articles on the Beatles and have made joint appearances at Beatles fan conventions. He previously worked as a media producer for the Democratic National Committee, press secretary for the Florida Democratic Party, and as a media consultant to political campaigns both nationally and in Florida. Harry has been interviewed on radio and television stations concerning the Beatles and music and television history. Walter J. Pedrajic is a communications and event consultant who has studied and appreciated the influence of the Beatles in media, culture, and history. He has collaborated on three books about the group with Harry Castleman. Their other books include Watching TV, Eight Decades of American Television. While he has also offered academic presentations on the Beatles, conducted popular discussions at fan conventions, and provided analysis on air, in print, and online. For Moment Magazine, in 2006, he co-authored the article, Brian Epstein, The Man Behind the Beatles, with Moment Editor-in-Chief Nadine Epstein. Wally currently serves as an adjunct lecturer at the University of Illinois at Chicago, where he has taught courses on future TV, television history, and the intersection of mass media and politics. Wally has served as television curator at the Museum of Broadcast Communications in Chicago and is a member of the board of the Library of American Broadcasting Foundation. Please welcome Harry Castleman and Walter J. Pedrajic. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned academic conferences. And at one of the academic conferences uh, a few years ago that I presented uh, at, uh, I took on the topic, The End of the Beatles, which happens to be the name of the third of uh, our, Be our Beatles books, The End of the Beatles with a question mark. But one of the reasons is that that's long been almost a parlor game uh, amongst Beatles fans, scholars, historians like us. When was the end of this hugely influential group? We're hearing a lot about that now with the uh, impending and unfolding uh, release of the a re-release, I should say, of the Let It Be uh, album, which was their final released album. Uh, there's going to be a special uh, extended documentary towards the end of November chronicling uh, the sessions that led to the uh, Let It Be film, for which that uh, album was the soundtrack of sorts. And so that would say, well, okay, there's the end. Or go back one step and say, well, the album... Abbey Road has a track called The End. All right, do you think that might have been what they considered the end? Or then you start getting into more esoteric personal paths that they took. Was the end when Yoko Ono entered John Lennon's life? When Paul McCartney held a press conference saying, I'm not recording with the Beatles for the foreseeable future. Those are all good nominations, but in my academic conference and repeatedly after that, I offer a far more intriguing date, much earlier, August 27th, 1967, before Magical Mystery Tour, before the White Album, before Abbey Road, before Hey Jude uh, became their most popular single. Why? That's the date that Brian Epstein died. And there is no way to overstate the importance of Brian Epstein in their lives. And the flip, there's no way to overstate the importance of the Beatles in Brian Epstein's life. Brian cared about the Beatles. Brian cared that the Beatles were the Beatles. It wasn't just that he had a great love and respect for John Lennon, Paul McCartney, George Harrison, and Ringo Starr. Brian felt it was very important that there be a Beatles. And when Brian died, the one person outside of their own foursome circle who truly believed in Beatles was gone. He had been there from the beginning of their ascent, and he had maintained that love for them through several tumultuous years as together they explored 
the possibilities of popular culture. We're coming to the anniversary of another date that bookended that death of Brian, and which is, and it's November 9th, 1961. That's the day that Brian Epstein in Liverpool, shop owner, walked the, might as well get the legend straight, the 250 steps from his shop in Liverpool down the 18 stone stairs that led to this cavern performance space known as the cavern. And that was the first time that Brian saw the Beatles in performance. It was a magical, mesmerizing moment. And Harry, why didn't you take us back there? <laughs> well, first, uh, I'm going to go back further and go back to looking at Brian Epstein and his family and their background and how he got to the point of walking down those stairs into that dank, dark, loud, smelly cellar uh, to see the Beatles at the Cavern Club. Um, Brian Epstein's family were Jews from Lithuania, Russia, that area. They came to England in the late 1800s and wound up in the northwest port city of Liverpool. Now, I didn't know this during the Beatle research, but Liverpool actually was the gateway for many, many Jews leaving Eastern Europe who were going to America. And I had done some personal family research and discovered that my grandmother, my mother's mother, had left for the United States from the docks of Liverpool. And when I visited Liverpool in 1999, it was rather emotional to stand there at the dock and realize this is where my grandmother came from. This is literally where she went to the United States. Uh, of course, not all the Jews went to the United States. The Jews that came into England, among them Brian Epstein's family, stayed there in England. And uh, his grandfather, Isaac Epstein, uh, founded a Liverpool furniture dealership. And later on, Isaac's two sons, uh, Brian's father, Harry, and his uncle, Leslie, joined the family business and it became, you guessed it, Epstein and Sons. Uh, the business did fairly well. Uh, they expanded their operations and they bought out the neighboring store, which was called Northeast, North, excuse me, North End Music Stores, NEMS or NEMS. And they began selling musical instruments, records, and household appliances. They were, so by the time Brian comes along, the Epstein family was fairly well established in uh, Liverpool and in the Jewish community in Liverpool. They were rather respected members of the temple that they belonged to. Uh, they, the family was not inordinately wealthy, but, the, you know, as the joke goes, they, they, they made a good living. Uh, and uh, they were always uh, seen at the high holidays, all dressed in their finery and so forth. During that, as a personal aside, during that uh, visit to Liverpool in 1999 with me, my, my then wife and my daughter, we stayed at a pretty crummy bed and breakfast in a place in Liverpool, which I knew was close to a place that Brian and the Beatles had first had one of their business discussions. And we were right across the street from a temple and I was very excited. So oh, this is where Brian Epstein was bar mitzvah. Uh, of course, ruining a good story, it turns out, I discovered later on, no, that wasn't his temple. His temple was in a much nicer section of Liverpool. But anyway, I thought I was uh, close to greatness there, but wasn't. Um, anyway, uh, Brian himself was born on Yom Kippur in 1934. Uh, so he's six years older, was six years older than the oldest of the Beatles, Ringo and John. Uh, Brian's mother, Malka, which is queen in Hebrew, was known as Queenie, and she was a very dominant figure in the family and had a very prominent role in Brian's life and was always very concerned about Brian and keeping an eye on him, making sure he was doing all right and so forth. Um, Brian did, it was assumed that Brian was going to go into the family business, uh, but he didn't want to do that. He wanted to be a dress designer. Um, his father really wouldn't have anything wouldn't allow that to happen. So Brian started working at, in the furniture shop, but was not happy. 
So in the fall of 1956, when Brian was 22, he uh, got into the prestigious uh, London Royal Academy of Dramatic Arts, RADA. Uh, among his classmates in uh, that year were Peter O'Toole, Albert Finney, and Susanna York. Uh, Brian was not in that caliber of acting um, talent. Uh, Brian stayed one year and then dropped out. Uh, he later said that he was too much of a businessman to enjoy being a student any longer. But his time in London on his own had exposed him to the gay underworld of London. He had also been in London a few years before during his compulsory military service. Same thing had happened. Uh, you have to remember, of course, at that time that being gay in England was illegal. And so it was something that you tried very hard to keep under wraps. And Brian was, as he went into the business world and into the music world, uh, he had in effect three strikes against him. He was Jewish, he was gay, and he was from Liverpool. All those things were negatives. Um, and he certainly didn't, couldn't hide being Jewish. It was kind of obvious, but he didn't emphasize it. And he was aspiring to be a more refined, upper-class social set and dressed well, spoke well, uh, and so forth. That's what he was trying to do. And a lot of Jewish families who were doing okay back then were trying to do that. They were trying to assimilate socially, if not, you know, certainly not religiously, into the world of more refined, upper-class uh, society. Um, so... After he returned from a short stint in, in Rada, it was back to the family business. Uh, his father put Brian in charge of the family's NEMS music stores, which were sort of operated as a separate business. And that's when Brian really took off. He really did very well. He loved it. It was involved in, in artistic work of some sort. And he became enthralled with it. And he became very good at running the store and making sure that he was catering to the, uh, the interest of, his, of the, the customers. If they wanted a record, he'd track it down and get it for them. Um, it, it, there was a good quote uh, from uh, Debbie Geller, one of the many people who wrote a biography of Brian, who said, he wanted to be an artist, not a manager. But Brian also had the self-awareness to see the difference between what you can do and what you'd like to do. And he chose what he could do. So, okay, he's working in the family business, doing well, he's doing so well that they open up the second branch of the NEM store, which yes, as Wally mentioned, is uh, very close, just a few blocks from the Cavern Club which was a local music club that originally focused on jazz music, but had begun uh, featuring some rock groups as well, including the local Liverpool Beatles, who at that time were John, Paul, George, and Pete Best. This was before Ringo joined. He was with another group. Uh, the, of course, during my pilgrimage to Liverpool in 99, I had to make a visit to the, the Cavern Club. The actual original Cavern Club is no longer there. The building was knocked down to make a parking lot. But right next to it, there's a building with like exactly the same footprint that they've renovated the cellar into a recreation of the original Cavern Club. And I went down there and visited it. And, you know, I, I, it is small. It's dark. It's, you can just imagine how it would be filled with, with teenagers and uh, rock groups. And, and in the summertime, it would be a hot, sweaty, uncomfortable place to be. But that's where the Beatles were playing. Um, the, the Beatles knew Nems, and they knew Brian Epstein because they often visited his shop, the Nems shop, to listen to records. The store had listening booths where you could go in and listen to records you were interested in and perhaps, yes, even buy them. Um, the Beatles by that time had been to Hamburg in Germany where they had played in some seedy clubs and they had gotten a lot of experience as a group and they had played back up to an English singer Tony Sheridan on a German 45 rpm record My Bonnie Lies Over the Ocean on one side and the, When the Saints Go Marching In on the other. The record did okay in Germany but had gone nowhere in England when it was released there. Brian had had some contacts with the people in the music business in Liverpool because he was involved in music. He didn't have much contact with the artists the more the, the business people. He had visited the cavern a couple of times, apparently, 
Uh, he was he had to be at least vaguely aware of the Beatles because they were one of the top rock groups in Liverpool and they were regulars at the Cavern Club and they had been prominently mentioned and featured in the city's Music Weekly, which was sold at the NEM store. And so at that point, Brian decided to finally see what all the hubbub was about. And as Wally mentioned, uh, he arranged to visit the cavern, cavern on November 9th, 61, when Brian was 27 years old. And he took with him his uh, NEMS assistant, Alistair Taylor, to see who these Beatles really were. And when Brian walked in, uh, he uses that as one of the pivot points in his own uh, biography, autobiography, um, Ghosted uh, by Derek Taylor, a um, uh, uh, cellar full of noise. And it literally was a cellar full of noise. And if anybody... And, and while I got to jump in, there's a great line. Apparently, I read somewhere that when Brian was telling the Beatles about that he was book was going to be called a cellar full of noise, John Lennon, who always had a very sharp tongue and liked to tweak Brian about being gay and being Jewish, said, ah, maybe you should call it a cellar full of boys. And, and, and then Brian apparently retorted, well, how about a cellar full of goys? Uh, which I thought was a pretty good retort. And and in the takeoff film, All You Need Is Cash, The Ruddles, uh, the character who's supposed to be Brian Epstein, um, his book is called A Cellar Full of Goys. And in fact, what this underscores is how deeply we are immersed in the story of the Beatles if we're explaining illusions in a parody film that came out in the late 1970s. In any case, Brian stood out. He stood out because he was in a suit. Rest assured that no one else was uh, in that environment. As it was a smoky room, it was a noisy room, and it was a casual room. And the Beatles on stage reflected that casualness. Um, he described them as, you know, chewing gum and eating lunch and flirting with the uh, uh, the fan, the female fans in, in the front rows or any place, turning their backs on the audience and just kind of meandering around. It was just another day at the cavern for them. It was hard for us to imagine the Beatles being in an environment like this, but it was like playing at your local school. It was like playing around the corner. It was not a big deal, but it was a big deal in the sense of this is where you would uh, cut your chops in the Liverpool environment and show off. And so basic, and, and the Beatles recognized him, uh, George, probably because of all the time they had spent uh, at the store, even if they didn't know him by name, they certainly knew him by face. And they certainly knew him by name because George said, so what is Mr. Epstein doing here? Uh, and Brian was there to say, I want to talk to you. And they eventually worked out a, what do you mean? And over a couple of encounters, basically said, I think you need management and I'm the one to do it. And to that point, the Beatles had sort of had management, but not really. I mean, it was the, the mother of drummer Pete Best had done some of their booking, so was keeping track of finances there. Um, a gentleman by the name of Alan Williams had spent some time mostly promoting himself, but at the same time um, saying, yeah, well, I can get some mileage out of this group as well. And so they were happy to be musicians, but it wasn't really seen, uh, certainly by their parents and all, as, well, that's going to be your career. No, I mean, get this out of your system and, and then go get a proper job. Um, but Brian was intrigued by them, and in, he was intrigued as a businessman. People had come in asking for this record uh, that no one had ever heard of, except they had heard of it, and you couldn't even hear the Beatles except their instruments. They didn't sing on this record, but people who were fans of the group wanted to possess a copy of that, so when he ordered copies, they sold. It's like, okay, the business part of me says this works, but it was going beyond that. When Brian looked at them, he was bowled over by their musical performance, not by their looks, though there was a charisma that they had on stage. Uh, but it was like, they need to be cleaned up. 
They, they, they need to work on their act. They need to have an act for crying out loud. It's not just playing song after song uh, in no particular order, but they've got something that is worth pursuing. And when that uh, when Brian shared that observation uh, with his business companion who came in, are you nuts, Brian? And Brian's response, Harry, was? You know, Brian apparently told Alistair Taylor, maybe not the first time they saw the Beatles, but maybe, you know, after the first, second or third time, he said, they're going to be bigger than Elvis and I'm going to manage them. And if you, I mean, it's wonderful to look back on that now, but if you try to put yourself back and be in that position and, you know, what kind of huge leap of faith was that? Who would logically make that conclusion? I, I don't think, I mean, Alistair Taylor didn't think so. He thought Brian, as well, he said he thought Brian was, was crazy. And he said, yeah, okay, they're all right, they're good. Um, but bigger than Elvis? Are you out of your mind? And so, you know, the fact that Brian, that was Brian's leap of faith that transformed his life and the Beatles' life. I mean, look, not only, as Lolly was saying, were they kind of scruffy, but they were playing maybe a couple of original songs, most of which you've never heard of. Maybe they were doing Love Me Do, you know, which is a nice song, but not one of their greater ones. They were a bar band. And to think they were going to be bigger than Elvis and to make it happen, that was a staggering leap of faith. And in doing so, I think that part of it was that Brian, Brian's ambition connected with their ambition in that, yes, he was doing a good job managing a retail store. For the artistically inclined Brian Epstein, managing a record store was not life's fulfilling moment. He did a great job. He had the best one around. So what? And in, in the case of the Beatles, they really, really, really dreamed of being successful. And they had little hints of it, but such tiny hints that it, and, and they didn't go beyond Liverpool. I mean, essentially, uh, it was, uh, when Harry mentioned the three strikes, they were all under that third strike of what's from Liverpool? How could that possibly, remember in the early 60s, Elvis Presley had been on top of the pop culture world musically for worldwide for nearly a decade. He was the gold standard. He was a movie star. He was a successful hit after hit recording artist. He was known by his first name. I mean, he was somebody that uh, every aspiring guitarist might say, oh, I want to be Elvis. But in this sense, Brian was serious when he said they could be bigger than Elvis. And, and so, you know, I mean, what he did for them largely was he did, he cleaned them up. He uh, put them in, in, in matching suits. He got them to, you know, uh, perform a, a regular set. He got them to, you know, bow to the audience after, you know, after songs. Uh, they were, you know, weren't, weren't being such smart asses uh, uh, on stage all the time. And Brian began getting them bookings all over the place, not just in the Liverpool area, but all over the north of England and then down into the southern part of England toward London. And of course, the goal was to get a record contract. Um, because again, Liverpool, which is now so well known at that time, that was really a backwater location. And all of the English music industry was headquartered in London, somewhat akin to the, in the US between, you know, New York and LA and maybe Chicago, other places are just kind of looked down on. And, and so when people would, would hear that Brian Epstein was coming, you know, from Liverpool, it was like, yeah, so what? Um, and and his the, the, there's several people who have written biographies of, of Brian have have commented on what he did and there's a great line from Glenn Frankel who also wrote a biography of Brian and he said without Brian they were just the best band in Liverpool without Brian the Beatles never get out of Liverpool and that's probably true they had no business sense they had artistic sense. <laughs> 
And one of the things, uh, when we talk about Brian um, cleaning them up and all, it was they were willing to be cleaned up. They were willing to be managed. Famously, John Lennon says, all right, Brian, manage us. Because they knew they were not going anywhere on, on, on their own business side. And strikingly, Brian promised practically from the beginning, I'm not going to interfere with the music. I might say, have a set set, but I'm not going to say, change this note or, or do this, uh, uh, this, this, this other turn when you perform the song. I'm going to make your presentation saleable. You're the ones who are going to come up with the, the, the musical vision. And that was very important to them. And an early example of how once they said, okay, manage us. Um, task number one, I'm um, going to get you a record contract. By the way, Brian, fire our drummer. Uh, because <laughs> they didn't... Uh, you, you might have this vision, even of John Lennon, you know, the, the caustic uh, John Lennon saying, oh, he, he could do uh, whatever he wanted. Well, they weren't real good at, especially at that stage of their careers, of these personal one-on-one -on -one confrontations that were, there, there were actually consequences. Like, so Brian, you be the one to get rid of this person. So one day Pete Best is there, and the next day Ringo Starr is there. And behind the scenes, Brian Epstein had made sure that that happened. Uh, and that, I think, is a good illustrative moment that Brian was the one to do the business. And he made it possible for them to increasingly focus on being the Beatles, the musical performers, being the Beatles who then were blossoming as songwriters, to being the Beatles who were blossoming as pop culture figures. And in, the, in their first year, uh, of his management. In 62, he did get them a contract. He got it with uh, EMI, uh, Parlophone, um, and the producer was George Martin, who had his share of hits, but they were mostly novelty hits or, or, or a real mixed bag. I mean, he produced The Goons, for instance, the, the uh, popular comedy uh, radio show, and they did some records. And appropriately, that was one of the entrees of respectability uh, between uh, the Beatles and, and uh, George Martin is like, oh, you know, Peter Sellers, we love Peter Sellers. That's great. And so that there was that bonding moment. But on a, more, on a business level, Brian's was, was six years older than the, than the Beatles, the oldest Beatle, but it was a big six years. Yes. And, and in terms of circles of respectability, he drove a car. He had a car. A fancy car. A fancy car. And so uh, because a couple of them were not yet old enough to sign a contract, Brian had to pitch his services uh, to the, uh, the Beatles' uh, uh, parents. And there again, um, let's go to cliches like, you're Jewish, you're a good businessman. Okay, that sounds good. Uh, you could probably do this. If if my crazy child wants to do this, at least you'll ground them and make sure that if it's going to happen, it's going to happen. Uh, and oh, by the way, I think I have some furniture from your store. So, I mean, there, there, there was this sense of, of connection. So Brian not only could sell himself to the Beatles and to their parents, but more important or most important for their careers, he could sell them in the business world. He had credibility when he went um, into the record world because he sold records. And even if they thought this guy was daffy trying to pitch this uh, group, he was a client. So they'll at least open a door for him to talk to somebody, let someone else turn him down but he would keep getting those doors open. And once a door was open, he left a positive impression, not uh, starting with the receptionist and working his way up. And, you know, uh, again, it's, it's uh, uh, his, he, he was very dogged in his work on behalf of the Beatles. I mean, it, while I mentioned they were signed by EMI Parlophone, but they had been turned down by virtually every record company in, in England. Uh, famously, they had a, a, a audition for Decca Records, which was probably the biggest record label in England uh, at the beginning of 62. And uh, they recorded about, I don't know, 14 songs. And uh, they said, no, no, groups are on their way out. 
uh, and but Brian managed to make sure he got a copy of that audition tape, and he used that tape to send around copies to other record companies to promote them and try to get an interest in them. And it was through that audition tape that he eventually got his door, foot in the door at, at EMR, EMI Parlophone. And yeah, Parlophone was like the smallest label uh, among the major record companies in England at that time. And so here's the Beatles with their very first single, Love Me Do, backed with P.S. I Love You. A couple of important things to point out. They wanted to have their own original compositions included on the records, and they won that battle. They, they won, won that uh, in, in fact, with producer George Martin. In fact, one of the songs that they tried to get the Beatles to record was called How Do You Do It, which was written by a British songwriter. Uh, and the Beatles kind of, uh, we'll record it, but we don't want to play it. And they didn't really put their heart into it. And they decided, George Martin finally said, okay, fine. I won't make you release this. And they did their own music. How Do You Do It winds up being one of the first hits for one of Brian Epstein's next clients, which is Jerry and the Pacemakers, who also come from Liverpool. And he takes that song that the Beatles didn't want to do, and he turns that into a worldwide hit. Strikingly, uh, as people were looking, do, do the Beatles have any kind of credibility? Here's that first single, Love Me Do. The striking part of it was that it stayed on the, it made the charts for one. The second thing is it stayed on the charts for an extraordinarily long time for a one-shot first record release. And it built their credibility with producer George Martin say, okay, maybe we can do more uh, together in the studio. Uh, there's a, a wonderful researcher by the name of Mark Lewison who has gone into hundreds and hundreds of pages of details on their history. And one of the footnotes that uh, he, he observed was that technically with the release of Love Me Do, EMI had uh, fulfilled its commitment to record X number of sides with them, but it did well, well enough to get them a second look. And so 1963, Brian begins to really show what he can do. He's got them the record contract that happened in 62. So now it's, how do we parlay that into something more impressive? Let's continue to build uh, your performing uh, schedule, your performing act. And so 1963, they conquered England. And, and also during that year, Brian begins expanding his musical universe. As I said, there was Jerry and the Pacemakers. There were a couple of other artists who were largely Liverpool oriented. Um, there was Billy J. Kramer and the Dakotas, the foremost, Scylla Black, who used to work as a, a, a hat check girl at the Cavern Club, uh, Tommy Quickly, and Brian signs all of them and he's managing their careers. Most of them wind up recording Lennon McCartney songs that, that Lennon McCartney, they were old songs that, that Lennon McCartney didn't really want to do on their own. And a lot of them became very famous and were selling well. And there were big, there were stars in England. And after England, by the end of 63, what is next? The, un, the, the Olympus of, of the musical world, America. And in this case, Brian knew how to parlay the value of publicity the value of a gig versus the number of dollars you got for being in that gig. And so uh, in, in England in 63, uh, there had been uh, the Royal Variety Show in which the Beatles were uh, one of the many acts to perform, but they were the ones who won the hearts of the press, got the publicity, and, and most important, um, they uh, uh, caught the attention uh, of the British London press, which dubbed the fan reaction, which had been always part of their uh, onstage charisma. I mean, people did literally scream when they were performing. They would come to uh, relatively small venues by uh, compared to, uh, to American standards. Uh, and uh, the audience was in rapture over that. And so the term Beatlemania uh, was uh, coined 
following uh, the, the Beatles' uh, performances at the end of 63. Leveraging all that, uh, Brian looked to the U.S. and instead of saying, let's do some big tour, let's get their names known. Uh, and so he went into negotiation with Ed Sullivan. And uh, this is where the, uh, the confidence uh, that Brian had, which was supported by one year of success in Great Britain. And he said, they've got to be the headliners. And then Sullivan's initial reaction is, are you nuts? Who's heard of these people? But he checked her, he, Sullivan, uh, checked around and said, all right, fine. They struck a deal. And the deal was great for Sullivan's budget. He got, in effect, three performances out of them, three shows worth of performances out of them. Uh, but as a flat fee, they didn't make as much, uh, I think, uh, the second uh, appearance, they didn't make as much as uh, uh, some of the other acts uh, that day. But it didn't matter because for Brian, what was important is he looked, Ed Sullivan, top-rated variety show in the U.S., if I'm going to introduce the group to this market, that's the way to do it. And of course, as I said, you have to remember that it, being on the Ed Sullivan Show was the top venue of American television at that time for variety acts, for performers. And so as it turned out, uh, when they first appear on the Ed Sullivan Show in February of 1964, I Want to Hold Your Hand had been out for like a month or so. And this group, which, and believe me, I remember it well from that time, a month earlier, we basically didn't know who they were. By the night they're on the Ed Sullivan Show for the first time, everybody wanted to see them and everybody tuned in. And the viewership on that first Ed Sullivan Show was the highest rated television program for many, many, many years. And so the Beatles now exploded in the United States and of course then worldwide. And shortly they had become, just like Brian had thought, they were in fact bigger than Elvis. They were a worldwide phenomenon and were much bigger and more popular and selling more things than anybody could possibly have imagined. And that becomes part of the, the problem from that point going forward. Because up to that point, Brian had been trying to convince businesses, trying to convince record companies, take the Beatles, take the Beatles, play the Beatles, convince uh, radio stations, play the Beatles, play the Beatles. Now it flipped. It was like, hang on, everyone wants them. So instead of being the, the person trying to peddle them, he becomes their gatekeeper. He has to. Uh, and in a way that makes sense as a manager, uh, you're the one who's trying to filter all of these offers. But the Beatles also happened to hit at the perfect moment in pop culture history in which television was exploded. The youth audiences uh, were, were uh, expanding their influence. Uh, they, they, were, they were primary consumers, both in the uh, United Kingdom and in the US. And so there was money to be made by being associated or glomming onto the latest teen fad. And rest assured, in 1964, when the Beatles released their first film, when the Beatles had their first U.S. concert appearances, when the Beatles appeared on The Ed Sullivan Show, the conventional wisdom is they ain't gonna last. And so let's get as much as we can out of them. Uh, and for instance, the, the first uh, feature film, A Hard Day's Night, was basically green light for a lot of reasons, but primarily because the United Artists wanted the soundtrack album. They wanted to be able to release that uh, domestically uh, under their label because who would care about the Beatles in a year? And, and what, what the film actually was about, they didn't particularly care. So they'd be happy to let a director, an innovative director like Dick Lester, do some very interesting things in that film, which has still holds up pretty well. But all United Artists cared about was, I want a soundtrack album before they fade off into obscurity. And then Brian and the boys, because he always called them the boys, um, had a very successful and exhausting 1964. And as Harry noted, the, the first hints of, this is a much bigger stage than Liverpool, the North of England, Great Britain. If you look at the itinerary that Brian designed 
for the first Beatles tour that happened later in the year, uh, the United States is a lot bigger than Great Britain. And yet, if you look at the uh, the order of cities, and I was like, why are you doing that? Why are you going here? And then coming back there, and then coming back there, and coming back. Couldn't you do it in a more disciplined way? But they still had the memories of, oh, yeah, well, you go here, then you get on the bus, and then a couple hours later, you're in this other town, and so you, you've done the tour. Instead, you're getting on a plane and flying from one state to another. Great Britain, just by uh, square footage, is like the size of Alabama. And you have a much more challenging task in trying to make uh, the logistics of a tour work, yet they did. Yeah, he and, managed to make those logistics work. And also the, the fact that they had become so big so quickly and so many people wanted, wanted to be connected with the Beatles that it's perhaps this is used as Brian's perhaps biggest business mistake. But in 1964, he gave up 90% of their merchandising rights to this company that had been set up to market Beetle dolls, Beetle scarves, Beetle mugs, Beetle t-shirts, Beetle cards, Beetle wigs, Beetle badges, and so forth. Um, that was, this was a new world of entertainment marketing that really didn't even exist in the Elvis era. And so the fact that he gave away 90% of the profits or the money from those things wound up kind of being a black mark against him business-wise that even the Beatles themselves, as, they, as time went on, began to resent a little bit. And that's the problem with looking at Brian is that in many ways, up until they explode in the US, Brian Epstein was the greatest person who could have come along and helped the Beatles. He was exactly what they needed. Once it got to that point, this was beyond what he, perhaps what, what he could deal with, what almost anybody could deal with who didn't have that kind of experience and who had that experience at that time. There was nothing like that. And so his handling of their business affairs going forward is perhaps questionable. But, you know, you, that's easy to, to look to say that in retrospect, looking back at it now, looking at it at the time, you can't really criticize him very much. And in fact, that sets a really important contrast. Uh, Brian was ethical. Brian was determined to do right by his clients. And in fact, when uh, he asked, just in, in, internally at, at his business, he was looking for like a standard contract to start with when, when he was signing with them. And he looked at it and said, this is awful. This is onerous. This is totally unacceptable uh, from the artist's point of view. And so what he did is um, he made sure that what he crafted was good for his clients. And, and that so, was really different from the standard. I, I heard a, an artist say sometime, and maybe he was talking about Brian Epstein, I don't recall, but he said, if you have a room full of musicians and ask all the ones who were screwed by their manager to raise their hand, everybody in the room is going to raise their hand. Um, I mean, think of Colonel Parker and, and Elvis. I mean, uh, he's been criticized for many reasons of his management of Elvis's career. And, and, but Brian, that was the thing that really was staggeringly different about Brian is that he honestly, genuinely cared about the Beatles and wanted to be fair and, and, and truthful and, and good for them. And he, he was in many ways. And so that takes us to a, a pivot point, and I think we're going to go get to questions very shortly. Um, takes us to a pivot point in which, uh, after 63 and 64, basically it was the same thing all over again. In terms of the performing part of them in the concert schedule, in terms of uh, being popular culture figures, remember, Brian didn't touch them in the studio. And so they were thriving in the studio. They loved the studio. They quickly grew to hate touring. So um, 65 was 64 again. They were a little bit better in that they 
played fewer venues. They played big stadiums. They, they broke some ground again, Shea Stadium, et cetera, playing huge stadium tours. And they got the MBE too. Uh, and people, uh, and Brian, for instance, finally started uh, emerging. He was like occasional host, uh, British correspondent on Hullabaloo, a TV show. So his personality was coming out, but he was still the man behind the scenes. Same thing in 66. In 66, so many things blew up in their collective faces. Because by 1966, the Beatles were more than Beatles. They were symbols of everything about the youth versus the established generation and capitalism versus, so they had uh, um, confrontations with uh, government in Manila. They had misunderstanding in Japan and most famously here in the US. Um, uh, John Lennon, a quote about the uh, viability of uh, religion in modern life, um, got turned into a rallying uh, cry for burning Beatles albums. Uh, don't want to know the value of those albums now on the collector's market. Uh, burning Beatles albums on bonfires. And Brian Epstein came ahead of the group to New York and said, if I have to, we'll cancel this tour. I don't care if we lose a million dollars. I don't want anything to happen to the boys. And um, eventually they did go through with the tour. Uh, Lennon did do the famous I Apologize press conference here in my hometown of Chicago. I've even uh, gone by the hotel where that took place. And in 1967, fully accepting the fact that the Beatles were not going to tour anymore. And that was uh, what he uh, lived for in terms of being manager, he nonetheless very enthusiastically got behind promoting their next phase. In early 1967, he was promoting their creativity, their single Penny Lane and Strawberry Fields, doing radio interviews and such. This is the, the, the new stage that the Beatles are performing on. When the uh, album, the studio-based album, Sgt. Pepper came out, he had a great launch party at his, uh, his London uh, um, apartment. Uh, and he was negotiating stuff for the future. He did a record deal, which went for nine years, but was tabulated, yes, by years, but they fulfilled it once they turned an X number of sides, which they did very quickly. And he knew that that would be a future- With, with the double album. <laughs> with, a, with a double album and a lot of individual tracks on Abbey Road, et cetera, uh, which he knew that that could be a strong negotiating point further on, long before the years passed on the contract, uh, they would have fulfilled what they had to do. Um, and what I like to point to is one of his last brilliant world publicity insights is came to them and said, uh, I've arranged, you could be on the uh, Our World, World Live telecast. It was the first time using satellite technology that the same TV program uh, staged in multiple countries could be seen throughout the world live. And the Beatles ended it. The Beatles got the uh, take a bow uh, spot in Great Britain, introducing the song, All You Need Is Love. And that was Brian's vision for them coming full circle and applying to the studio world, and it worked incredibly well. And that was in uh, June of 1967. Uh, Brian's dad died in July of 67, and uh, Brian himself died, as we mentioned, in August of 1967. At, at the age of 34. And so he was a very young man when he died. And Yes, the Beatles continued after that. In some ways, with the moment, he also set up the Yellow Submarine film. So basically, he had put a lot of things into motion that they would benefit from in the years to come. But the heart that he brought to keeping the Beatles as Beatles was gone. And there was no one else who could take that spot. No one had been there from the beginning. And most important, there was no one else there that they could trust. And his, his legacy, I mean, uh, again, he, he had many, many, many positives. He had some negatives as we all do. But to me, the, the, 
best summation of Brian Epstein was from a very good friend of his, Nat Weiss, who was sort of the Beatles' U.S. lawyer and sort of their business manager in the U.S., and he was a personal friend of Brian Epstein. Um, and uh, Nat Weiss had said, said this about Brian. He was an honest man, extremely fair in his dealings. He was very compassionate and understanding of his fellow man. He believed in mercy and compassion. He was very kind and generous. Brian adhered to the best tenets of Judaism he kept to the highest values of the Jewish faith. Uh, you know, that's a pretty nice summary of somebody. Uh, in my mind, if you want to boil all that down into one word, I think you could fairly say that Brian Epstein was a mensch. On that note, why don't we take some questions? Sounds good. Thank you both for that wonderful teaching for us. Uh, I, we have a lot of questions coming in. Um, the first, you've explained this a little bit, but um, see if there's a little bit more about why is it that 54 years after his death that there is still a fascination with Brian Epstein? There's been books, documentaries, articles. There's a feature film called Midas Man in the works. Um, why do so many people still want to know more about Brian Epstein? When you see Brian uh, in film clips, because uh, he came in an era when you could capture it, it's not just, just words, uh, he has a presence. He had a presence. And he had this insight that no one else had. And so just as people have tried to explain Beatles since the day they topped the charts, uh, this force behind the Beatles becoming the Beatles is equally fascinating. How did he do it? What did he see? Who was he? Because for the most part, most people didn't know him. He st definitely stayed off on the side uh, unless he was needed to go in front of the cameras uh, for a, a key press conference, etc. You'll note in the film, A Hard Day's Night, the fictional day in the life of the Beatles, there is no Brian Epstein character. Uh, there is no Brian Epstein character actually in any of their movies. Uh, he just wasn't there. Thank you. Uh, a lot of people are asking, how did he die um, at such a young age? He died uh, of a yeah. um, drug overdose, or I suppose that's more correctly to say it was a combination of uh, drugs and alcohol. Certainly was not the only person of notoriety to that fall victim to that. Think of more recently, you've got like Tom Petty, um, perhaps uh, Michael Jackson, so forth. Brian's health, I mean, he was really, you know, running ragged. He was trying to do a lot of things, trying to keep a lot of balls in the air. He felt with the end of the tour, of touring that his fear was that the Beatles didn't need him anymore. And there was perhaps something to that. Um, or at least they did not need him in the way they needed him before. It's almost like being jilted by a lover. Uh, he felt bad about it. Um, and honestly, his contract with them was up in a few months. Uh, would, was it going to be renewed? You know, probably it would have been renewed in some form or other, but it would have been like it was before. No. So, you know, you can hypothesize all kinds of things about his mental state and so forth. But uh, it seems, although there's, you know, people have suggested perhaps it was a suicide. That seems rather unlikely to either of us. Of course, you don't know, but um, it's he, he wasn't in the greatest mental condition at that point. But that's, I think, as far as I could say. Yeah, and it was clear uh, reading about his actions at, uh, around that time, he loved his mother, Queenie. Uh, she had just lost her husband, as I said, in, in uh, July of 67. There was no way he was going to deliberately break her heart with another loss like that a month later. Mm -hmm. um, and, and what was the reaction uh, from the Beatles uh, upon his death? Well, there's a great film clip of the Beatles being interviewed um, right after he died because they were off uh, in a weekend retreat with the Maharishi Mahesh Yogi. Um, and they literally look shell-shocked. Um, and as well they should be because here's somebody who had, A, uh, made them helped make them worldwide stars who had handled all their business affairs and so forth. And they didn't have to worry about that. And now he's gone and there's nobody looking after their interests. And so they didn't know what to do. 
Um, there was proposals that other people might step in as his manager, uh, as their manager, uh, but they began to be more infighting between the individual Beatles as to, well, what should we do? Should we do this? Should we do that? The Magical Mystery Tour film was, Paul was pushing that, you know, I don't think maybe John was such so hepped on that than, than as Paul was. Uh, they wound up uh, getting Alan Klein, uh, a New York uh, music manager, to kind of come in as their 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 manager after that. But Paul McCartney had wanted nothing to do with him, and and Alan Klein is a completely different character. You'd hear about the good cop bad cop thing. Well, I, with Alan Klein and Brian Epstein, you've got the good Jew bad Jew, um, uh, and and Alan Klein. Yes, he got them a lot. Of money, he cleaned up what the 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 wasteful uh, uh, operations of Apple Records, but Alan Klein was looking out for Alan Klein, and the Beatles were just one more commodity uh, that, that he could take advantage of. And, and an, an example of that would be uh, he was very determined to renegotiate their contracts for better royalties, etc. And he was able to do that because of the provisions Brian Epstein had put into place in terms of they'd already fulfilled their uh, contractual obligation to turn in X number of sides, X number of songs. So Klein was able to use that as a point of leverage. Is it true that Paul tried to step in and be the role of Brian Epstein? No one could be Brian. And, and, and see, the challenge there is Brian was equal in the sense of he was there from the beginning with Paul saying, I want to be like Brian. Well, he couldn't do that because there are four of them. And one, two, three, four. Yeah. At any one moment, any one of them might say, I'm number one. And certainly if anyone was going to say it, it was going to be John Lennon, who had uh, the, uh, he formed the group, who started the group. But John was already looking to life after Beatles uh, with Yoko Ono uh, and artistic endeavors that way. So did Paul try to be Brian? I, I don't think you could argue that. Did Paul try to be the one to keep them doing more projects and more Beatles projects and more Beatles projects? Yeah, he, he freely admitted he didn't want to see the Beatles ending. He took comfort there. Uh, on one of the anthology albums, one of the Beatles says some nonsense word like Shalabat, and another Beatle sounds like he responds Shalom, as if he had heard the initial words as Shabbat and maybe was completing a phrase he had heard, perhaps from Brian or in Queenie's house. Are you familiar with this? Are, are his ears, is this person who's asking the question, his ears deceiving him? Um, is there any known backstory? Great question. I'll, I'll let the Jewish expert Wally Pedrazic handle it. <laughs> I'm, I'm just laughing because earlier on in the talk, uh, we were alluding to something on an obscure parody of the Beatles story and all. And I'm glad to see that we have people there out in that audience who are equally as immersed <laughs> in the minutia as we are. Having said that, I can offer no more than what you've just said. I mean, I cannot say, oh yeah, if you look at page 75 of the companion anthology book, they will explain that particular reference. I can't point to that. But, but, but I have seen references of people who knew Brian, who was on tour with him. And he did, they did say that sometimes when they were on tour, like in the US, if it was a Friday night, um, he would, you know, find some, you know, can, is there like, you know, a Jewish family I can go have Shabbat dinner with? Um, because that's, to him, that was, you know, it was more of a cultural thing than a religious thing. To him, Shabbat meant the family dinner with his mother and, and his folks. Uh, and so, you know, it meant something to him. So perhaps uh, he could have, they could have heard that phrase somewhere. And, and also, it's important to remember how young the Beatles were uh, when all this unfolded, uh, John, the oldest of them, born in 1940, which means they're about 30 at the traditional marker point of, um, of well, when did they break up at the let it be, etc. The immediate question would be, what are you going to do now that you've graduated college and are going out into the real world? Oh, we've only changed the world over the last 10 years. Now what? So, so the Beatles were young men who were who loved playful language, who who loved enjoying 
a good laugh. And so, yeah, I wouldn't be at all surprised if hearing the musicality of words that they would be incorporated into their back and forth banter. Mm -hmm. Uh, the Beatles had several names before they stuck with the Beatles. Mm -hmm. Was Brian Epstein responsible for uh, picking the Beatles or making that the one that they stuck with? No. No. Yeah, that was John Lennon. And, and the Beatles were sort of an homage to the crickets, Buddy Holly and the crickets. Uh, and it's Beatles, you know, not B-E-E-T-L-E-S, but B-E-A-T-L-E-S. So it's a homage to Buddy Holly and also a pun on beat music. Great. So our time is coming to a close. So I'll ask you one last question. Uh, if Brian had lived, uh, could he have successfully adapted to the ever expanding pop culture machinery that he himself had set into motion? Oddly, the state of the Beatles Apple Company now is what it should have become. Right now, the head of Apple Records, uh, Apple Company, uh, has experience as a, a, a brand manager. Uh, he'd done uh, things with Bob Dylan, for instance, uh, in terms of uh, leveraging his, his product, his image, et cetera, across all sorts of uh, 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 opportunities. But it needed about 25 to 30 years to get to that place. Uh, and so the only way Brian probably could have done it is if he had taken some serious time off. I think he had the insight. I think he had the instincts, but he had just helped, he and the Beatles had built this platform that hadn't existed before for pop groups. And they were trying to figure out how it worked. And the way we have it work now needed a lot, there's a lot, big learning curve there. And so he would have done an okay job continuing to do what he did, but uh, it was actually bigger than them all as early as 1965 and 66. Right. Anything else you want to add, uh, Harry? Uh, no, I mean, you know, it's, it's easy in retrospect. You can almost say in some ways that Brian Epstein died at the right time. I mean, you hate to say something like that, but in some ways it's perhaps true. Uh, like Wally, I think that it would be questionable as to what, what his life would have been like with them after, after 67. Uh, so, you know, in some ways his, his career was a short meteoric career. He accomplished a huge amount. He's a, he has a lot of things to give him credit for and to, you know, respect him for. Uh, and perhaps we can therefore, you know, overlook some of his shortcomings. Great. Well, thank you both for this fascinating, wonderful conversation. I want to thank everybody for joining us. We will send a follow-up email that will include a link to the books that Harry and Wally have written so you can check them out. Uh, please don't forget to go to momentmag.com where you can register for next week's Zoominar, which is QAnon's anti-Semitic roots. Um, and again, Wally and Harry, thank you both so much, and we'll see everybody next time. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.